Celtic Myths and Legends by T. W. Rolleston. Chapter 2 The Religion of the Celts. The Celts of the Mountains. Finally, we have a third group, the true Celtic group which I get such high arches from, obviously, which followed closely on the track of the second. It was at the beginning of the sixth century that it first made its appearance on the left bank of the Rhine. While Bertrand calls the second group Celtic, these he styles Galactic, and identifies them with the Galata of the Greeks and the Galli of the Belga of the Romans. The second group, as we have said, were Celts of the plains. The third were Celts of the mountains. The earliest home in which we know them was the ranges of the Balkans and the Carpathians. Their organization was that of a military abstract. Uh, my speech gets fumbled at times. Of a military aristocracy. They lorded it over the subject populations on whom they lived by tribute or pillage. They are the warlike Celts of ancient history, the sackers of Rome and Delphi, the mercenary warriors who fought for pay and for the love of warfare in the ranks of Carthage and afterwards of Rome. Agriculture and industry were despised by them. Their women tilled the ground, and under their rule, the common population became reduced almost to servitude. Plens, plen, suburum, habitur, loco, as Kazar tells us. Ireland alone escaped in some degree from the oppression of this military aristocracy and from the sharp dividing line which it drew between the classes. Yet even there, a reflection of the state of things in Gaul is found. Even there we find free and unfree tribes and oppressive and dishonoring exactions on the part of the ruling order. Now, it was recently pointed out that in my country, there was the, you know, the, ex the exposing of how, in a particular case, completely unnecessary, well, not nothing's completely unnecessary, right? But um, not necessary. Um, enough money to cure world poverty for 200 years. Millions of people killed. Completely, just you know, just for a political game. And half of the money that isn't classified as direct or indirect welfare for the rich, half of that's military in my country. The following 32 countries' budget for war is equal to our budget for war. So we're number one equaling 1 through 33. That's, yeah. Um, and from the sharp dividing line that drew between the classes, yet even there was a reflection of the state of things in Gaul is found. Even there we find free and unfettered, tri unfree tribes and oppressive and dishonoring exactions on the part of the ruling order. I think I read that. Um, yet, if this ruling race had some of the vices of untamed strength, they also had many noble and humane qualities. They were dauntlessly brave, fantastically chivalrous, keenly sensitive to the appeal of poetry, of music, and of speculative thought. Posidonius found. Posidonius, Posidonius found the bardic institutions flourishing among them about 100 BCE and about 200 years earlier. Hecataas of Abdera describes the elaborate musical services held by the Celts 
in a western island, probably Great Britain, in honor of their god, Apollo, Lu. See Holder, Alt, Celtus Chair, Sprash, Chats, Subvoice, Hyper, Boreoi. Okay. Aryan of the Aryans, they had in them the making of a great and progressive nation. But the Druidic system, Aryan originally meant noble, so we're not necessarily being racist in saying that. But the Druidic system, not on the side of its philosophy and science, but on that of its ecclesiastical political organization, was their bane, and their submissive and their submission to it was their fetal weakness. The culture of these mountain Celts differed markedly from that of the lowlanders. Their age was the age of iron, not of bronze. Their dead were not burned, which they considered a disgrace, but buried. The territories occupied by them in force were Switzerland, Burgundy, the Palatinate, and northern France, parts of Britain to the west, and Illyria, and Galatia to the east. But smaller groups of them must have penetrated far and wide through all Celtic territory, and taken up a ruling position wherever they went. There were three peoples, said Kaiser, inhabiting Gaul. When his conquests began, they differ from each other in language, in customs, and in laws. These people he named, respectively, the Belga, the Celta, and the Aquitani. He locates them roughly, the Belga in the north and east, the Celta in the middle, and the Aquitani in the west and south. The Belga are the Galata of Bertrand, the Celta are the Celts and the Aquitani or the megalithic people. They had, of course, all been more or less brought under Celtic influences. And the differences of language which Kaiser noted need not be great, but still it is noteworthy and quite in accordance with Bertrand's views that Strabo speaks of the Aquitani as differing markedly from the rest of its inhabitants and the rest resembling, resembling the Iberians, the language of the other Gaulish peoples. He expressly adds, were merely dialects of the same tongue.